Well, <clears throat> let's begin, shall we, by reading <clears throat> our text in Luke chapter 3, beginning in verse 21. Uh, this is one of those readings that um, is perhaps a bit more difficult and maybe one of those areas we tend to skip over because um, some of these names are unfamiliar and sometimes difficult to read. And I have to admit that as I read them, they don't exactly roll off the tongue. Some of these names are pretty difficult, and I may make a few mistakes as we go through. But uh, let's go ahead and read it, because it is a part of God's Word, and it is here for a reason. But let's begin in verse 21, shall we? We read this, Now when all the people uh, were baptized, Jesus was also baptized. And while He was praying, heaven was opened. And the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came out of heaven, You are my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. <clears throat> when he began his ministry, Jesus himself was about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, the son of Eli, the son of Mathat, the son of Levi, the son of Melchi, the son of Janai, the son of Joseph the son of Mattathias, the son of Amos, the son of Nahum, the son of, of Hesli, the son of Nagai, the son of Maeth, the son of Mattathias, the son of Semain, the son of Josek, the son of Jodah, the son of Jonan, the son of Resa, the son of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the son of Neri, the son of Melchi, the son of Adi, or Adi, the son of Kosum, the son of Elmadam, the son of Ur, the son of Joshua, the son of Eliezer, the son of Joram, the son of Mathat, the son of Levi, the son of Simeon, the son of Judah, the son of Joseph, the son of Jonam, the son of Eliakim, the son of Malia, the son of Mena, the son of Mattatha, uh, the son of Nathan, the son of David, the son of Jesse, the son of Obed, the son of Boaz, the son of Salmon, the son of Nashon the son of Amenadab, the son of Admin, the son of Ram, the son of Hezron, the son of Perez, the son of Judah, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, the son of Terah, the son of Nahor, the son of Serek, the son of Ru, the son of Peleg, the son of Heber, the son of Shelah, the son of Canaan, the son of Arphaxad, the son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalil, the son of Canaan, the son of Enish, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. <coughs> well, may the Lord bless his word to our hearing. By the way, this is a, um, uh, a genealogy that traces the lineage all the way back to the very beginning. Um, I think there are some indications here for dating, uh, uh, dating the earth. Um, that it's not perhaps, well, it's not certainly not as old as... Um, as evolutionary science makes it out to be. Well, let's, um, let's take a look at <clears throat> what we see in this passage. And first of all, by way of review, this morning, remember, we saw John contrasting himself and his ministry with that of Jesus to show the Jews, of course, why they should follow him. And those reasons were, first, because Jesus is mightier than John. John preached in the spirit and power of Elijah but Jesus, with the anointing of the Spirit beyond measure, by the way, we do see that uh, anointing uh, this evening in our text, uh, so that his ministry would be far more effective, far more reaching than that of John's. Uh, secondly, because Jesus is worthier. Even though John was um, among the greatest of uh, the men who have ever lived, uh, Jesus is a divine person. Even though he shares our nature, his person is divine, and so he is infinitely worthy. John did not consider himself good enough even to loosen the straps on his sandals. Uh, we should listen to Jesus because Jesus baptizes with the Holy Spirit. John could baptize with water, symbolized a person's change of mind and change of direction. But Jesus could do so with the Holy Spirit who really is able to change the heart and the life. I mean, John's effect may have been temporary. Jesus is permanent. And because Jesus will make uh, the final 
separation. Remember, John's ministry had the effect of sort of winnowing out those that were openly repentant or unrepentant in Israel, but not those who were secretly so. Uh, Jesus sees what's in the heart. He knows who it is that belongs to him now, and he will receive them on that final day, but he also knows those who do not belong to him, and he will cast them out on that final day. Jesus is the one who makes the final separation. And finally, uh, John told the Jews that they should follow Jesus, and of course we should as well, because his ministry continues long after John's has faded away. Uh, one thing we need to see is sort of John standing at the end of the Old Covenant. Uh, not just the Old Covenant, but, but the Old Testament. Essentially everything that came before up to that point that was pointing to Jesus. John was the very last one to point to him, and as we'll see this evening, to actually point him out, okay? Uh, all of this was meant to prepare the Jews to receive the Messiah, um, and that was John's role. But now that Jesus was here, his ministry was to move forward while John's was to conclude. Now, this evening, we, we pick up Luke's story at this particular point, and we see essentially four things. We see Jesus now baptized by John and anointed by the Holy Spirit, publicly approved by his Father, and we see him begin his ministry, which the genealogies will remind us, as well as um, uh, Luke himself, that his ministry was going to be for all mankind, not just for the Jews, but also for the Gentiles. <clears throat> now, first of all, we see Jesus baptized by John. Uh, this morning, you know, we saw uh, Luke uh, look ahead to John's arrest and to his imprisonment, but obviously he wasn't in prison yet. We saw that also this morning. Uh, John had one last job that he had to perform before he was to be moved off the scene, and that was to baptize the Lord's Messiah and to announce his arrival to the Jews. Well, here Jesus finally appears uh, to submit himself to John's baptism. Now, uh, there's a question that we, we should ask ourselves here, which maybe sometimes we don't, but somebody is going to bring it up if uh, you've never thought of it before. And the question is, why is it that Jesus was baptized, uh, particularly you know, by John, particularly when John's baptism was a specific kind of baptism, and that is a baptism of repentance? Well, we, we realize, I mean, we know, first of all, it wasn't because Jesus needed to repent. Jesus, obviously, is the spotless, morally perfect Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. If Jesus himself was not sinless, he would not have been able to save us. Obviously, that, that's not the reason. But the reason why he's baptized is because of the nature of his work. Remember, Jesus is, uh, his work is vicarious. His work is substitutionary. And that doesn't apply just to the cross. It applies to absolutely everything that he did. Uh, Jesus in becoming for us the one who would guarantee the blessings of the covenant of grace, eternal life and inheritance of the eternal kingdom. He had to do everything that was required of us so that he might give us these blessings. As a matter of fact, Jesus actually refers to his taking his, his, our place on the cross as a vicarious baptism as well. Uh, if you think about the instance in Mark 10, verse 38, he said to James and John, remember when, when James and John's mother came to Jesus and said, Lord, grant that in your kingdom my two sons might sit, one on your right and one on your left. Would you give my sons the, the seats of honor in your kingdom? Uh, Jesus responded to them in this way in Mark 10, verse 38. You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? Jesus referring to his sufferings and death as a baptism. As water is poured out on us in, in baptism, 
Jesus is saying, so God's wrath was going to be poured out upon him on the cross as he was baptized into God's judgment for us, even though he was personally innocent. Jesus went to the cross and he suffered and died even though he was essentially an innocent man. In the same way, he submitted to this baptism of John, this baptism of repentance for us. He did this vicariously that he might give to the Father on our behalf a, an expression of a perfect and absolute hatred of sin and a full purpose to walk in holiness. That's essentially what John's baptism represented, this baptism of repentance. Are you going to listen to God? Are you going to do what he has, what he tells you to do? Well, Jesus is saying, I'm going to do that, and I'm going to do that with a perfect heart. Now, again, Jesus did this for us so that he might give to us this same kind of heart, this same kind of purpose. He was baptized to fulfill all righteousness that he might give us the Holy Spirit so that we might be able to do the same thing by his grace. Now, that's one reason why he was baptized. There was another reason. It was that John might be able to point him out, that he might be able to identify him uh, before the Jews. We read in John chapter 1, verse 31, where John the Baptist says this. And it sounds kind of confusing at first, but let me, I'll have to explain it a bit. He says, I did not recognize him, but so that he might be manifested to Israel, I came baptizing in water. Now, the interesting thing is this, that when Jesus presents himself for baptism, the first time he appears, John knew exactly who he was and what it was that Jesus had to give. And that's why John said to Jesus when Jesus originally came in Matthew 3, verses 14 and 15, I have need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? But Jesus answered him in this way. He says, permit it at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he permitted him. Okay, so John knew who Jesus was. So what, is, what does he mean when he says, I did not recognize him? Well, he, what he meant was this. One thing we tend to forget is that John and Jesus were actually both related. I don't know if you remember that. But um, when Elizabeth conceived John, uh, Mary conceived Jesus, she went to visit her relative, Elizabeth, which means that if Mary and Elizabeth, the mother of these two, are related, then these two are related as well. We don't know their exact relationship, but we do know they were related. And yet, John didn't recognize Jesus when he saw him. He didn't know him by sight, which simply means they didn't actually grow up together, okay? They're, I mean, Mary had to go visit Elizabeth. I'm sure there was a lot of things going on. And we also understand that as John was growing up, he went out into the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. So the two were separated. He didn't know Jesus by sight. And yet, when Jesus appeared for baptism, he recognized him immediately. The Spirit of God said to him, as he said to Samuel, when David arrived in Jesse's house, remember when the Lord sent Samuel to anoint the next king of Israel? He says it's among Jesse's son, and Je Jesse brings all of his sons before Samuel and says, not any of these. But as soon as David comes in from shepherding the flock and he sees him, the Spirit of God says to him, arise, anoint him, for this is he. And I think in the same way, the Spirit of God reveals to John the Baptist who Jesus is when he appears. So the second reason why Jesus was baptized is so that John could identify him in John chapter 1, uh, we see uh, basically John saying, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world the first time he sees him. Now, the Lord also gave John a sign by which to confirm that this is, in fact, the Messiah. We read also in John chapter 1, verse 33, John says again, I did not recognize him. But he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, He upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. Now again, John already knew who he was before he saw this happen. But the fact that it happened was also an indication to John that this is, in fact, the Messiah. And so this is what we see next in our text 
in Luke 3, verses 21 and 22. And while he, that is Jesus, was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. Now, this descent of the Holy Spirit upon the Lord Jesus Christ, it wasn't just to identify Jesus, although it certainly had that effect for John who saw that and he knew this is the one, uh, but it was also to empower Jesus to anoint him for the work that he was now about to begin. Now, the Spirit we know from uh, Sinclair Ferguson, remember, was Jesus' constant companion. Sometimes we tend to think, although we shouldn't, that this is where the Spirit of God begins to work in the life of Jesus. Well, that isn't the case. The Spirit of God was active at Jesus' conception. He was the one that overshadowed the Virgin Mary and conceived Jesus in her womb. He was present with Jesus through his youth. He was instructing him and discipling him and helping him to learn and understand his Father's will. And certainly, he was with him into his adulthood. But now, the Spirit comes upon him to anoint him for his ministry, to anoint him above measure, to empower him as he begins to do the work his father sent him into the world to do, as we read in the book of Isaiah, chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, where the Lord says through Isaiah, then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. You know, I don't know if, you, if, if this strikes you, but as we read this, this is the, what the spirit was going to be for the Lord Jesus, who is God in our nature. Again, does Jesus need these things? Yes, because he is coming into the world as a man and he needs to be anointed by the spirit to do his ministry which means that essentially what Jesus was doing, the, the, uh, the power by which he did these things, is the same power by which we do these things. His experience was not altogether different than ours. Jesus is fully man. Now, the Spirit of God came upon Jesus in the form of a dove to symbolize, you know, what a dove symbolizes, holiness, right? The purity of the dove. Uh, peace, the, the dove is often seen in Scripture as a symbol of peace, representing the fact that Jesus was holy and innocent and he came into the world to bring peace. He came into the world to reconcile his people with his Father, again, as the angels sang uh, to the shepherds at the birth of Jesus Christ in Luke 2.14. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. That doesn't, say, that doesn't mean that Jesus won't judge. We know that Jesus will be judge in the end, but in his ministry on earth, this was the time of grace. This was the extension, as it were, of the, of the olive branch of peace to God's people first and then to the Gentiles. Uh, remember what Jesus told James and John when they went um, to a village and, and they preached the gospel and these villagers, this particular town, rejected Jesus. And James and John came to Jesus and said, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to, to consume them? Well, this is what the Lord said to them, and this will be in Luke chapter 9, verse 54. He turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know what kind of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. So again, this is a time of grace, and by the way, that time of grace extends up to the present, and it will extend until the time Jesus comes again, and he says there's, there's going to be time no more, no longer patience for people to repent. When the last of the Lord's people has been gathered in, then will come the time of judgment, and Jesus will judge. That's also not to say that he isn't judging right now from heaven. He rules with a rod of iron. He's the one that raises up nations. He's the one who brings them down. Jesus is an absolute control. But again, the point is, the Lord is extending the olive branch of peace, and this symbol of the dove coming down represents what Jesus' ministry was going to be all about. Uh, notice also that the Spirit of God came down from above, okay? Of course, He comes down from heaven. We would expect that. 
But I think we also see in this something of what we see in the Old Testament, which was symbolized by the anointing of prophets and priests and kings. Whenever one was anointed to that particular office, there was always the anointing oil that was poured on them from above, that was poured on their head and would basically drip down their bodies, something that sounds very uncomfortable to us today, but uh, something that then represented the anointing of the Holy Spirit to give them the power to do their office. Uh, well, instead of pouring oil on the head of Jesus, the Father sends the Holy Spirit down from heaven to anoint him. But that's what's behind this kind of symbolism, that the Spirit of God might anoint Jesus to do what had to be done in order to reconcile us to God. Now, thirdly, we see Jesus' public approval by the Father. Luke tells us in, in chapter 3, verse 22, a voice came out of heaven, you are my beloved son, in you I am well pleased. And again, to understand this, I think we need to remember that Jesus is the eternal son of God and that as the son, he has always eternally been loved by the father with an infinite love. But that isn't exactly what the father is addressing here. What we see is the Father openly expressing His love for His Son as a man at the beginning of His ministry. Remember what Luke told us, I think it was last week we saw, in chapter 2, verse 52. <clears throat> Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and, and man or and men. Uh, Jesus grew or increased in favor with God. If this is referring to His you know, his eternal divinity, that wouldn't make any sense. But if it refers to Jesus the man, it makes perfect sense. Essentially, uh, the father was watching his son grow, and he was seeing his heart, his devotion. He was seeing his, his learning, his worship, his obedience, and the father was becoming more and more pleased with his son, and he was so pleased with what he saw in him that he had to express that love openly to everyone who was present at this inauguration of Jesus' ministry. That's really a marvelous thing, but Jesus pleased the Father in absolutely every way, in everything, from the very beginning to the end. He never slipped even for a moment, and that was necessary for us to be saved. Now, one other thing to think about is this, that this is the same pleasure that the Father has in us, when we are in the Lord Jesus Christ, when we repent and trust in His Son, when we are baptized into Christ by the Holy Spirit and are essentially clothed with the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father has that same pleasure in us because He sees us in His Son. So Jesus was baptized. Jesus was anointed by the Spirit. Jesus will obey. Jesus will die in order that the Father might love us and take pleasure in us as he takes pleasure in his son. And this brings us to our last point, which is essentially this, that his ministry was not, again, just for the Jews, but it was for all mankind. And that's why Luke, by the Spirit, includes this genealogy to show us that this child is the one that the Lord has been promising to send into the world since the fall. Now, there's a couple things that I think we need to notice here, um, especially as we <clears throat> compare this genealogy with the one we see in, in Matthew's gospel. Uh, the first is that though Luke and Matthew both trace Jesus' lineage from Joseph to David, uh, both of them actually do it uh, from a different son of David. I think if you've read these, you've probably noticed that difference. Uh, Matthew traces... Um, Joseph's genealogy, which, you know, essentially is Jesus, from Solomon. Now, we read in Matthew chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, David was the father of Solomon by Bathsheba, who had been the wife of Uriah. Solomon was the father of Rehoboam, Rehoboam, the father of Abijah, and Abijah, the father of Asa, and so on, down the line to, to Joseph. So he traces it from David's son, Solomon. But Luke traces it from David's son, Nathan. 
and he's kind of going the other direction, so we, we have to kind of reorient ourselves here. He's, he starts with Joseph and, and works his way back to David instead of going from David to Joseph. So he says in Luke 3, verses 31 and 32, the son of Nathan, the son of David, the son of Jesse. Now, what's going on here? Okay, why, why the difference? Um, well, some have tried to explain this difference in genealogies by saying that in the Bible, we often find differing individuals to have different names. And uh, these are the different names of these same individuals from David to Joseph. In other words, Solomon had another name. It was Nathan. Well, it is true that sometimes in the Bible there are different names used for different individuals, uh, but there's a lot of different names here. And uh, I don't know that we could prove that that would be the case, that Solomon was ever called Nathan for one, or that all of these individuals have these alternate names. Uh, but there is a simpler explanation, and I think it's the right one. And that is that Matthew is tracing Joseph's line all the way back to David and to Abraham. But Luke is tracing not Joseph's line, but rather Mary's line. And I think it makes, I think it makes perfect sense because if we look at the genealogies in the Bible, we often notice that the Jews will trace a person's lineage through the head of their particular family. Now, Luke is giving us Mary's line, but lists Joseph because he is Mary's head. So verse 23 can essentially read, without doing any, any um, you know, harm or injury to the language, it can read this way. When he began his ministry, Jesus himself was about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, the son-in-law of Eli. Rather than the son, he's a son-in-law. If you're a son-in-law, you're also a son. But then the question would come up, why would Luke give us Mary's lineage instead of Joseph's? Well, here's one plausible explanation. Joseph is Jesus' father, but of course he is his adoptive father. And that would be enough to qualify Jesus as a son of David. Remember, Jesus had to be the son of David in order to rule on David's throne. If, if adoption wasn't enough, why would Matthew uh, even you know, trace his lineage for us to Joseph? Okay, so it's important that Joseph be of a son of David. As a matter of fact, he is addressed as such um, by the angel. Okay? But I think what Luke is pointing out here is that Mary is also descended from David. And of course, Jesus is actually connected to her uh, by birth. Remember, we saw in the beginning here that uh, in Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5, that Jesus was born of a substance. Jesus is connected to the human race through Mary because essentially the Holy Spirit uh, caused the conception of one of Mary's ovum. He fertilized that and brought about uh, the, essentially the creation of, of the human nature of Jesus Christ connected to our race and yet conceived and born without sin. So essentially what he's telling us here is that Jesus is a true son of David through both his father and his mother. Now another th the thing that's interesting as well is that Luke, remember, in his gospel is emphasizing the place, the role of women in the life and the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it makes sense that he would be the one that would show us the connection to Mary whereas the others may not necessarily do that. So the first thing to notice is that we have two genealogies going from Joseph to David, but one of them is Joseph's and the other one is Mary, showing us that Jesus is a son of David from both sides. Now, the second thing to notice is that Luke traces our Lord's human lineage all the way back to Adam, the son of God, while Matthew traces it only as far back as Abraham. And the reason behind that is because of the audience that is involved in both of these Gospels. Matthew was writing to the Jews. He wanted to show Jesus' connection to the Abrahamic covenant, that Jesus is the promised seed of Abraham through whom all the nations would be blessed. And he wanted to show the connection to David, that he is a legitimate heir 
to David's throne. But remember that Luke is a Gentile, you know, and he's writing to Theophilus, who is also a Gentile, and so he traces God's promise back to the origin of the entire human race, which would include, of course, both Jews and Gentiles, and uh, that's really the entire human race. Uh, he traces it all the way back to Adam. <clears throat> now, he may also have wanted to show us that where the first man failed, Adam, the second Adam, Jesus, would not fail. Jesus is the promised seed of the woman who would crush the head of the serpent and would free his people from Satan's tyranny. He is the promised seed of Abraham who would bring blessing to the entire world. And he is the son of David whose throne God would establish forever. This is the one who would undo the mess that Adam made through his failure and bring blessing, not again just to the Jews, but to the entire world. So here again we see our Lord Jesus uh, baptized for us to fulfill righteousness, anointed with the Holy Spirit that he might have the power to do what his Father had called him to do. We see the uh, public approbation, the public blessing of the Father upon his Son because of his being so well pleased with him. And we see the Jesus work is essentially for the entire world, including us. The reason why Luke was saved, the reason why we're saved, is because of what Jesus Christ has done. Now, next week, we're going to look at his first battle with our captor. Remember, the seed of the woman has to crush the head of the serpent. Adam was in the wilderness, or I should say Adam was in the garden, and he was tempted by the devil, and he, he fell. Well... Jesus will also be tempted by the devil, but he will succeed where the first Adam uh, has failed. Uh, that we'll look at um, next Lord's Day. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to um, just to be thankful that um, he has sent his son into the world to do these things that he has done on our behalf.